We're we are joined by uh, Maggie Goodlander, who is a, a candidate for uh, U.S. Congress in the New Hampshire Second District. Thank you very much for taking the time. And um, I, I I guess the what everything boils down to, although we'll continue to ask questions after this, uh, is, is you and your primary opponent. Um, seem to be on the same page regarding a lot of major issues. Um, why should voters choose you? Well, that's the question, you know, um, and that's the question that we're lucky since we still have a democracy here in New Hampshire and in America that we can make that choice. So um, if I could, I'll just tell you who I am and what brings me to this race. I was born on election day right here in Nashua. Uh, my mom, Betty, was serving in the state house at the time and she went into labor and she went directly to our polling place at Broad Street Elementary School in Nashua to vote before she went to St. Joe's Hospital to give birth to me. And that is really the spirit in which I was raised. Um, my mom's a fighter and because of her, so am I. Uh, when I was two years old, she ran for this same congressional seat, and her detractors developed a slogan, uh, which was, a woman's place is in the home, not in the house. And um, that was a winning slogan in 1988. And, you know, today there's still less than 30 percent women in the people's house. But I was raised to believe, as I do today, that a, a woman's place is absolutely in the United States House. Um, and now... We're taking back that slogan and flipping the script in this campaign. Um, you know, I've New Hampshire made me who I am today. And I was born and raised here from my living room today in Nashua. I can see the shoe factory where my great grandfather worked and the hospital where my mom gave birth to me after she voted. Um, I became a lawyer by training here in New Hampshire, but I became an advocate in my heart. And I've been on the front lines of the fights that. I think are on the ballot this fall, the fights for democracy, the fight for fairness and the fight for freedom. You know, I, in the fight for democracy, my dad always said he got his education in the United States Navy and so did I. I served 11 years as an intelligence officer in the Navy Reserve. And I went on to be a part of a team of incredible constitutional lawyers and scholars and investigators who impeached former president and now convicted felon Donald Trump for the first time. I teach the Constitution at, at Dartmouth and at UNH, and I teach it because I really believe in the next generation of, of our country and of our state. Um, I believe that no politician is above the law, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk about the United States Supreme Court and what Congress can do to check the power of the court. But Congress has a really important role to play, as I've seen firsthand, in holding big corporations accountable, because no corporation is above the law. And I spent, when President Biden was elected, I went to the Justice Department where I was on the front lines of the fight against some of the biggest corporations in the world, corporate monopolies that are really jacking up the cost of rent, making life harder for hardworking Granite State farmers, uh, jacking up the cost of prescription drugs and of healthcare across the board. This is something I hear about every single day on the, the campaign trail. People are feeling real pain because prices haven't been higher and, and neither have corporate profits and wages aren't keeping up. I, I wanna take this fight to Congress because I believe there's there are real things that we can do, including on a bipartisan basis, um, to make the cause of a fairness and a fair deal for all Granite Staters possible. And let me just end with a word on freedom because I'm in this race, really, here we are in the Granite State, we, we the live free or die state, no one believes in freedom more than we do. And freedom is on the ballot this fall. You know, women got the right to vote in this country a hundred years ago and two years ago, the United States Supreme Court took us back in time, ripped away a fundamental right that is really the source of gender equality in this country. Um, I was really proud to be a law clerk to Justice Stephen Breyer, who wrote the dissenting opinion in that case, the day Roe v. Wade was overturned. And, you know, I think we all remember where we were the day that decision came down. I was at the Justice Department helping to fight back, helping to stand up a reproductive rights task force dedicated to ensuring that women in this country get access to the health care they need and that doctors can provide that care without fear of prosecution. 
I know from my own experience and I see and hear every single day on the campaign trail, the stories of women who are being denied access to healthcare. Um, and this is wrong. This is, this, this is a fight that starts in Congress. And this is a fight that brings me to this race. It's a fight I know how to fight because it, it starts in Congress, but it doesn't end there. It's gonna require creativity and drive a real understanding of our federal courts, which I have, and a real understanding of the executive branch. And look, every day on the campaign trail, I hear from voters in our district about Project 2025, and I'm glad that we're talking about it because it's a bone chilling document, something in it to scare the living daylights out of anyone. And what we're up against is a, a genuine threat of an abortion ban in this country. But New Hampshire today, we're the only state in New England without any constitutional or statutory protections for abortion access. Planned Parenthood has been defunded and a 15 day abortion ban was introduced in our state house. I wanna bring this fight to Congress uh, just like I wanna bring the fights for democracy and for fairness um, to Congress. And, and I'm in this race because I really believe that I'm ready on day one to deliver for the people of this district. And look, day three on this job is January 6th. So the stakes could not be higher. There's no time for a learning curve. And I'm in this race because I wanna do this job. I wanna do the work and I wanna deliver for this district. Okay, well, let, let's talk about some of, the, uh, uh, some of the issues that might come up uh, in Congress. Um, as a, as a Congress person, what would your approach be to the situation in Gaza and you know, our early, role? Yeah, you know, I think Congress plays a really important role in American foreign policy. <clears throat> and I saw this firsthand early in my career when I went to the United States Senate. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, it was a different time. Um, there were bipartisan, bicameral, super majorities of members uh, who worked on issues together every single day. You know, early in my career, I was part of a bipartisan group. We came together, passed a landmark sanctions law, imposing accountability on Vladimir Putin and his regime. Um, together with many colleagues, I am banned from Russia for life because of this work. And today, you know, I think there's a real imperative for Congress to play a role in American foreign policy. And when it comes to the situation in Gaza, you know, when I worked in the Senate, um, there was a humanitarian crisis uh, in Syria at the time. And what we saw there is is really what we're seeing um, in Gaza today, which is a it's heartbreaking for anyone who sees the situation on the ground. Um, you know, two million people on the brink of starvation. Um, it's a genuine humanitarian crisis. But look, there was a ceasefire on October 6th. And on October 7th, that ceasefire was broken um, when Hamas, a terrorist organization dedicated to the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people, um, undertook and carried out the deadliest attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. So, you know, the war is hell and what we're seeing is hell on the ground. And I think the role the United States plays is a really important one in bringing about, and, and it is my fervent hope that we will see some progress on, on the ground. You know, people, hardworking people are at this day and night um, trying to bring about what in the first instance, I think is is three really important pieces to a long-term solution that we need to be working towards, which is a two-state solution in which Israel um, can exist as the democracy that it is with the security that it needs and deserves. Um, together with a, a better future, dignity um, for the Palestinian people, free from the repression of Hamas. But to get on the track towards a two-state solution, we need we need a return of the hostages who have been held in brutal captivity for more than 10 months now. We need a surge in humanitarian assistance to help people on the ground in Gaza who are suffering gravely. And that th th these conditions... I hope um, and and I pray that we'll bring about a ceasefire that will allow us to pursue um, a better solution and a more sustainable long-term solution in Gaza. Okay, I would, uh, the faceless one, would like to pivot to um, immigration, which is one of the major campaign issues, at least on the Republican side. Um, how 
do we fix what many refer to as our broken immigration system? And part two of that is how do we address the challenges at the southern border? Well, you know, I think about my great grandfather every day. He came to this country at 16 years old. He didn't speak a word of English. He came from northern Greece through Ellis Island. Uh, he he was able to come to this country, got a job as a dishwasher, earned enough money to make his way here to Nashua, um, where he built the the family farm. I grew up down the road from this farm, and he he was able to pursue the American dream because we had immigration laws and an immigration system that could meet that moment in time. Um, you know, because of what he was able to do, my grandfather went on to be a door to door Electrolux vacuum cleaner salesman. He, he was able to pursue his dreams. And, you know, my mom went on to graduate from UNH and to serve in our state house. All this was possible because we had laws on the books and a, situ in a, in a system, an immigration system that could meet the moment. But what we see very clearly today is outdated laws, an overburdened system, and one that cannot deliver the kind of justice uh, that this that this country deserves, um, chronically underfunded and in desperate need of an update. And, you know, I teach the Constitution. When you read the document, it's crystal clear that Congress has a real central role to play in ensuring that we've got updated immigration laws and that our border is secure. So early in my career, I went to the United States Senate and I, I worked um, on a bipartisan effort to bring about comprehensive immigration reform and border security. You know, we envisioned, um, it, we put together a framework that really has been the framework for current efforts that we see underway. This may all sound familiar because just a few months ago, um, President Biden was prepared to sign into law um, a comprehensive bipartisan immigration reform and border security bill. Um, and, you know, it's not a perfect bill, but it, it's a bill that would do a lot of good for the American people to keep our border safe. You know, when we talk about the southern border and border security, you know, today overdose deaths in New Hampshire um, are being fueled by deadly drugs, synthetic opioids that are being brought across official ports of entry at our border. You know, these by criminal cartels and other criminal enterprises that are getting their supplies from chemical companies in China. But the supply chain runs through in many cases, official ports of entry. And part of what this bill um, that the president was eager to sign and that had bipartisan support, uh, what it would have done was to update border security technology that was in desperate need of federal funding and an update. Um, ultimately, you know, Donald Trump is the reason that we don't have this these updates to our border security technology and the federal funding that's needed. And the reason for that is he saw it in his own personal political interest to hold up this funding um, and to hold up these important reforms. This is wrong. Um, and I believe we gotta, we've got to have a reset here. You know, one of the things, Ted Kennedy was a real leader on immigration reform and border security in the Senate. And he, he often said, you know, you've got to find the 30%. You may disagree with someone on 70%, but you've got to find the 30% and get it done. You know, I think sometimes comprehensive can be the enemy of progress. And in Congress, I want to be a part of, of dry, finding the 30 percent or, you know, as the case may be, it may be like 3 percent in some cases or 0 0.3 percent. But to find areas of agreement and to get the job done, and that's what I've tried to do my entire career. Um, Maggie, um Thanks for the uh, thanks for coming in today. And my family once bought a vacuum from an, a door to door Electrolux salesman. You know, Rick, you're not the first person I've met on the trail who um, it may have been my grandfather, Sam, but he he, um, he um, covered a lot of territory. What what steps would you support to control inflation and to address the debt and deficit? These are really important questions. You know, every day on the campaign trail, I hear from people who are feeling a lot of pain from high prices, you know, across the board. Um, among them uh, are the, is the high cost of housing in New Hampshire. And I think of this number 82% every day because 82% is the percentage increase over the last six years of the cost of a single family home 
in New Hampshire. Um, last night I was in Lebanon and 82% is also the percentage increase in the median gross rent um, in that part of our of our district in the Upper Valley. And um, there, so to me, you know, a core piece of addressing the pain that people are feeling from high prices um, is to address the housing crisis. And that's gonna take, we know, uh, building 60,000 new homes in New Hampshire by 2030. Um, so that's gonna really require that we address the barriers and constraints um, that we're facing right now, whether it's in scaling up water and sewage infrastructure and access um, to actually build new homes, or we're addressing, you know, zoning laws at, at the state or local level that are also barriers um, to building affordable homes for granted staters. So we got to increase supply. But, you know, what I saw from my work at the Justice Department, um, the traditional tools of collusion, um, whether it's it's price fixing um, or other forms of collusive corporate practices, we're seeing it both for people who are trying to rent a home and look for a senior on a fixed income um, or you know a single mom of two trying to buy a single family home or pay rent is just becoming an impossibility you know, I was talking to a sing a, a mom in Keene a few days ago who was just seeing the price of rent being jacked up again and again what I saw from the Justice Department was that the traditional tools of price fixing the traditional practice of price fixing, is happening more efficiently and effectively than ever before as more and more landlords become corporations, corporate landlords um, that are carrying out um, price fixing uh, practices that are jacking up the cost of rent. What we're also seeing um, is a trend towards multi-billion dollar private equity firms um, and hedge funds purchasing up single family homes all across this country and even here in New Hampshire. and. What they're doing is is jacking up the cost of buying a home for hardworking people. You know, a senior on a fixed income or a single mom of two is is going to lose again and again when up against um, a multi billion dollar private equity firm. Um, so what I'd say about this is there the what I saw uh, at the Justice Department is that the the laws, our competition and consumer protection laws, or antitrust laws in particular are rooted in ideas that are as old as America. It's about checking power and ensuring a fair deal for all. Um, these laws in some cases haven't been updated in more than a century. And there are some really exciting proposals on the table that I think would directly address themselves to the pain that people are feeling um, from the forces of inflation and high prices all across the board. I was really focused on the housing industry, the healthcare industry and our agricultural industries um, in a very consolidated U.S. economy. These are three very consolidated industries, um, and you know I think that that I want to bring this fight to Congress because I believe that the tools we have, although many in many cases powerful and and um, totally able to meet the moment, um, there are changes that that Congress could make to these laws that will allow us to address high costs um, of inflation. It's to the effects of inflation, I should say, high prices. Um, what What would you propose regarding tax policy? Yeah, look, you know, I think that we need a fair and understandable tax code in this country. I think that the the Trump tax cuts, which have given a massive break to the ultra wealthy and to large corporations, um, have have been really bad for this country. And I, I think that those tax cuts um, should expire um, and should not be renewed. So, you know, I my view is um, there's a lot Congress can do at the federal level to, to ensure that we've got a fair tax code, um, that the wealthy are paying their fair share, um, and that everyone can understand and, and trust um, that our system of taxation is is fair and consistent with the values of this country. Um, Maggie, how do we uh, lower the cost of child care for families um, and at the same time make sure that child care workers are paid equitably? You know, I hear about 
the high costs of childcare every single day. And I hear about the struggles that um, the extraordinary people I've met every day on the trail um, who are on the front lines and, and providing childcare services across our state are feeling. Um, you know, part of it is um, on, so it's a, it's a supply and it's a demand issue. We've got to address both. You know, we've got to really increase the sources of federal funding that um, will allow for us to have affordable childcare in the state, um, and and we've got to make sure that that our our childcare workers who are so important to the future of our state and our country um, are getting a fair shake, and that uh, they're being paid fairly for the important work that they're doing, um, that they're able to to build a life here in New Hampshire. And a big piece of this goes to housing. I would say we've got to increase the pipeline. Um, and we can't do that if we don't have affordable housing in the state. Um, but you know, I, I when you look at the cost of childcare as a percentage of income in the state, I talk to people every day who are paying a huge percentage of their income towards childcare, or simply having, as you know, I heard in Keene just a few days ago, to make the really difficult choice that because childcare is so unaffordable, you know she couldn't go back into the workforce. It just didn't, it was it was impossible to make ends meet. Um, I think we should take a hard look at every proposal on the table, including capping the cost of childcare in this country. Um, the idea that childcare is, is sometimes taking up 30 or more percent of um, a person or a family's income is, um, is not right. So I think, you know, in Congress, I would want to take a really hard look at every every conceivable proposal um, to lower the cost of childcare and to ensure that our childcare workers um, are, are being treated fairly and compensated fairly um, and able to pursue the American dream themselves. Um, it, it, this goes to the core of, you know, women are still being paid about 75 cents on the dollar in America today. And so many women post COVID were unable to return to work um, in part because the crippling cost of childcare. So this is, um, this is this is a this is a core freedom and rights issue. It's also a core fairness issue. Okay, through the magic of city and fiber, <laughs> I think you should see video now. <laughs> um, if not, I still apologize because I, I can see you, Lori. Great. Hello. <laughs> Hi. So you talked um, already about what we can possibly do to create more affordable housing and how. Affordable housing has this domino effect, or the lack of affordable housing. So, you know, cities in the second district. Uh -oh. I think you're getting broken up um, on audio by having the video there. You really are having a problem with homelessness. Lori, I'm, I'm going to jump in how, um, because I'm not hearing what you're saying and I'm not sure if others, others are. Address that solution. Okay. Um, so sorry about that. Um, I think when she turned on the video, she she lost some audio there. Um, so um, we. I think Lori might be back. Oh, Lori, sorry, I missed the. If you can unmute yourself and try again, Lori. Okay, maybe it, can you hear me with the video on? Um, I can now. Earlier, you were getting chopped up when you were asking your question. Okay, so I began by saying that Maggie, you already touched on affordable housing and things we can do to address that situation. My follow on question is what about the homeless? You know, we have a problem with homelessness across the country. Um, so what's your solution for the unhoused? You know, I saw um, in the work I did as, as, as a lawyer here um, in New Hampshire and also in the work I did at the Justice Department to create the first ever Office for Access to Justice um, 
which sounds like a, a you know a redundancy how could the office for access to just how could the justice department need an office dedicated to access to justice but it was really important because coming out of the pandemic we were seeing um eviction rates going through the roof all across the country and you know for those who have been in housing court um it's one of the most challenging legal landscapes that I've ever seen because most people who um, are being evicted from their homes don't have representation. It's a lot like domestic violence cases where, you know, over 90% of people who are navigating these really tough, life-changing, life-altering cases don't have representation from a lawyer. Um, so we were laser focused on this, but what I saw is just and what I is consistent with what I've been hearing every single day on the campaign trail, which is that so many people in our state are living, you know, one parking ticket away from eviction. And that's no way to live. Um, and so many because the cost of housing is through the roof and unaffordable, we're seeing a rise in homelessness, houselessness um, across this state. And what I can tell you is I, I think we've got to we've got to address these two challenges are so inextricably connected because we have to make housing affordable um, to give, to, this is the core cornerstone of the American dream, um, to have a place to live. And, you know, what, what I've seen day to day in my work and in the last 103 days that I've been traveling around the state on the campaign trail, um, it's no way to live, um, to be on the cusp of or living um, in a houseless, houseless. Um, so we've got to scale up. We got to address the housing crisis, and and as I said before, you know that's about increasing supply, and using every every available tool to increase affordability, um, and lower costs for both renters and home buyers. Um, we've also got to continue to invest in the sources of federal funding that go directly to the most vulnerable among us, and. You know, one of the questions I get every day on the campaign trail is which committee would you want to serve on in the House of Representatives if you could choose? Sometimes I get which subcommittee would you want to serve on? This is why it's so fun to be candidate in New Hampshire. We have such a great, we have such an engaged, um, we have such an engaged district. And part of it maybe is that you learn how to grill a candidate before you learn how to grill a hot dog in New Hampshire. But the the committee I would want to serve on is the Appropriations Committee, because I believe it's the place where I could make the biggest difference for the district. Um, you know, the the work of the Appropriations Committee, Senator Shaheen is one of my heroes and watching what she's been able to do for the state. Um, I think it'd be a really powerful combination to have someone representing uh, our district and our state in the House of Representatives on the Appropriations Committee, because, you know, this is where the fights are fought um, and could be won to ensure that sources of federal funding that are so essential to help the most vulnerable among us are protected and expanded um, and, and and operating at their very best. Okay, I'd like to ask about Social Security and Medicare and their possible insolvency by the 2030s. Um, I read a Pew Research study that showed that 42% of those not yet retired think Social Security benefits are not going to be available for them. So what would your solution be for addressing Social Security and Medicare? You know, to start with Social Security, um, we just last week marked um, the anniversary of uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signing into law the Social Security Act. And, you know, I wanna come to solvency and um, the important work that's gonna have to be done to protect and to make Social Security work. Um, but, you know, when when first, but but what I'd say is sometimes we forget that, um, and I've, I'm attentive to this because I've seen, we've seen this happen before, um, you know, when Amy Coney Barrett, Justice Barrett, was nominated to the Supreme Court um, just four years ago um, in September, almost September uh, 2020. You know, one of I've read all of her opinions. I read all of her law review articles. Um, and I noticed that there were some casual suggestions um, around Social Security and its constitutionality. 
And I think, you know, the, the, the field for the most, um, for the worst Supreme Court decisions in American history gets more competitive every single year. Um, and sometimes the worst law uh, that the court makes arises from casual suggestions in law review articles. But my own view is that we have to take seriously um, any suggestions that Social Security itself, the Social Security Act, is unconstitutional. And it's going to take a massive defense um, of that statute in the first instance. And we cannot be caught flat footed um, because what we've seen is how quickly really bad and destructive law can be made by the United States Supreme Court. And I hope we can we can talk a little bit about Supreme Court reform because it's such an important part of what Congress needs to do to make sure uh, that democracy is delivering for the people of the state. Um, but in the first instance, I want to be a part of protecting social security and its constitutionality against court challenges. Um, I also want to be be a part of making sure um, that these essential American programs, social security and Medicare, um, can continue long into the future. I, you know, I think that this is one where it's been a long time since we've been able to work um, on a bipartisan basis. And, and it's part of the reason why I really believe we've got to take back the people's house. Um, I have a lot of faith that under a speaker, Hakeem Jeffries, we could do a lot of good for this country, um, do a lot of hard and good work um, that we haven't been able to do uh, because we haven't had the majority in the people's house. Bill, do you think I could jump in with the Supreme Court question here because Maggie is sure. ready to respond to that? Yeah, um, absolutely. A good segue. Um, again, back to Pew Research, 51% of Americans have an unfavorable view of the Supreme Court. Um, and that report just came out August 8th. And most of that seemed to do with rulings that were seen as political, but there have also been ethics issues. So what do you think Congress should do, if anything? You know, what I, I love teaching the Constitution, um, especially to people who, with all due respect to lawyers, to people who aren't lawyers, because the document was written for us, for us all, not just lawyers. Lawyers don't have a monopoly on the Constitution. And when you read the Constitution, it, it's so clear that Congress plays a critical role in um, the checks and balances that operate across government, but to, to ensure um, the accountability of the Supreme Court. And accountability is so important because, as you point out, Lori, today, most Americans uh, do not trust the Supreme Court and have, do not have faith in the Supreme Court. Um, this is a this is itself, it used to be one of the most popular and trusted institutions in American public life. And in the past two decades, um, that trust uh, has eroded um, for, for a number of reasons, including two you mentioned. You know, the first is um, the real questions that have been raised. Um, and I give great credit here to um, investigative journalists in this country, including at ProPublica and elsewhere, who have really dug in um, to serious concerns around the ethics of, of the Supreme Court, of, of certain Supreme Court justices. Now, you know, when you read the Constitution, you get to Article 3, it says very clearly that the justices of the Supreme Court get to keep their jobs on an important and express condition. And that's the condition of good behavior. Those are the words the document uses, good behavior. We've seen a heck of a lot of bad behavior. And I, I believe deeply that it's past time the Congress stepped up and wrote uh, a binding code of conduct and ethics for the United States Supreme Court. You know, I worked in two federal courts, um, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals and then on the Supreme Court. Uh, there is no reason why Supreme Court justices should not be subject to the same important ethical um, and conduct based constraints and oversight that other federal judges and ju are, are subject to. Um, good behavior is a constitutional condition of employment, and that should be enforced by Congress. Um, I, I believe equally that, you know, an 18 year term limit is good government. And we see that there is agreement on this idea across the ideological spectrum. You know, constitutional scholars of all varieties agree that an 18 year term limit is good government. And that's because it's 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 a basic idea. No one should keep their job. Um, without any conditions for, for forever. 
Um, and it's just bad government for any person to keep a job um, in, in a job of such consequence for as long as I've been alive. And that is almost the case um, in the case of Justice Thomas, um, who's been on the court for almost as long as I've been alive. 18 year term limit is good government. I'd also add, you know, and this is a little bit more in the weeds, but when you read, you know, the constitution makes it clear that Congress should play a role um, in helping to check and have uh, oversight create guardrails around the important decisions that the court makes about what cases to decide. So when I was, was clerking for Justice Breyer, um, we got 7,000 petitions from across the country. Uh, the Supreme Court would hear from, you know, we received handwritten petitions from federal prisoners and state prisoners all across the country, handwritten petitions from people who were trying to access public benefits, um, 7,000 petitions. The court decides just 70 cases. So this is a big pool that becomes a very small pool. So the decisions around what to decide, what cases to hear are really consequential ones. And you know the, the constitution lays out some very narrow and specific categories of cases that the court must decide. For example, disputes between two cases, um, disputes involving foreign officials, you know, this is these are sensible cases for the court to definitely decide. Um, but other than that, Congress plays an important role in helping to regulate the, the, the kinds of cases that the court should decide. And I think that's a really um, important piece of business that, that I would want to be a part of. I think crafting the right kind of legislation um, is going to take a lot of care and attention um, to the details. And this is one of the things I believe you know, I'm in this race because I believe I have the experience will allow me to do that um, on day one. Um, so there seems to be a, a, a movement in this country um, to roll back protections for uh, LGBTQ individuals and the focus this election uh, seems largely to be aimed at painting uh, the trans population as somehow dangerous or too deviant over the line. It, is there a line, and 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 what what kind of role does should Congress be playing in that kind of cultural um, situation? Yeah, you know, I to me, um, these attacks and they they are attacks that are rooted in the same um, target, which is freedom. You know, we 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 see attacks on um, the ability of women to access their own health care, to have control over our own bodies. Uh, we see the same attacks against some of the most vulnerable among us, trans kids who are trying to to do what every American should be able to do, play sports, uh, to be in a safe learning environment, to be given dignity and respect and equal protection under the law. So it is a constitutional issue. Um, our constitution couldn't be clearer that it, it, it allows us all equal protection. And, you know, I think the fight for freedom and the same attacks that we're seeing on our freedoms are rooted in the same place of, of government control. And in the live free or die state, uh, no one believes in freedom more than we do. And what we're what our campaign is about is, is fighting for the freedom of women to have control over their own bodies, for all of us to have control over our own bodies, to be able to be who we are, to love who we love, to marry who we love, if we choose, to read the books we want to read, to be able to teach the books we want to teach. Um, these are all these are these are all fundamental freedom issues that you know have been called into question by an extreme agenda um, that Donald Trump has been at the head of um, for eight years now, and it's it's an agenda that we see playing out in our courts. Um, it's agenda that we see playing out in our state house here in New Hampshire, um, and I believe we've got the Constitution on our side, uh, and and I believe that if we can take back the House we will bring federal law to where it needs to be. You know, so much of the attack on freedom has shifted, has really made it imperative that Congress steps up and protects 
the basic freedoms that we didn't take for granted before. Um, but to me, this is all part of the extreme movement that we're seeing in our politics um, that we've we've got to push back on um, and be ready to pivot from so that we can actually get back to the real challenges rather than targeting the most vulnerable among us. Uh, let's focus on the real challenges that we have as a country. And you know, the job I left to come run for the seat, it gives me a lot of hope uh, because I think we can do that. I, the, the job I left was at the White House leading the Biden-Harris administration's unity agenda. And it's a, an agenda that you don't hear a lot about because division and disunity get a lot more attention than unity and progress. But this is an agenda dedicated to the basic proposition that we can still come together as Americans to solve our biggest challenges. Um, and one of those challenges, uh, there were five big issue areas that the agenda was focused on. Uh, one of them was tackling our mental health crisis. Another one was holding big tech companies accountable. And the two are connected because what we see um, among our kids and the most vulnerable kids in particular um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an epidemic of mental health that is in many cases fueled by, you know, our Surgeon General tells us um, the completely uh, law-free zones that we see on our social media platforms um, that are fueling hate and fueling a mental health crisis among um, our kids. So the, the, But we were able to make progress on these issues. And this is what I want to do in Congress. I want to find the 30% or the 3% that I was talking about before, you know, the areas of, of, of agreement and uh, and do that and get the job done. What would you do about the Affordable Care Act and fixing health care? Well, you know, um, it's been said that when someone shows you who they are, you should believe them. Um, in the case of Donald Trump, he said not just that he would want to terminate the Constitution, he'd want to terminate the Affordable Care Act. And look, this is um, like the Social Security Act. We can't take these kinds of suggestions lightly. And what we've seen um, since the Affordable Care Act was signed into law uh, was has been a real assault and attack on that statute. And, you know, I've seen from the perspective of Article three in the federal judiciary, you know, I've learned a lot from what Congress can do uh, to legislate in a way that's going to protect um, our most important piece of legislation. You know, and, and one of the in the as we said before, uh, the very competitive field of the worst Supreme Court decisions in American history. Um, one decision that I hear about um, often on the campaign trail uh, is is the court's decision earlier this year. Um, to get rid of the Chevron doctrine, uh, which, you know, is a really simple rule of thumb that federal judges had used for decades, that um, in the case of an ambiguous statute, you defer to the experts. So, you know, you listen to the people who know what they're talking about is the basic idea. The court got rid of that doctrine, and we're going to see its impacts all across the federal government, you know, um, including uh, you know, especially with, with our EPA and its ability to man administer environmental laws. But we're going to see it, too, um, in the case of the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, one of the, you know, this isn't entirely glamorous work, but one of the things that I think I take away from this Supreme Court decision and so many of the really damaging decisions that the Supreme Court has issued is that Congress has got to pick up the baton and do the hard work of making sure that our most important federal laws uh, are going to be administrable by, um, you know, the patriotic public servants across the the federal executive branch who are charged with administering these laws. You know, at the at CMS and other parts of HHS, um, at the FDA, and we've got to make the changes that are going to be needed so that these laws aren't so that, that these laws can be enforced in mission critical laws like the Affordable Care Act. Um, so this is going to be not. This is going to be glam not glamorous work, work in the trenches. Um, but this is this is the work that I know how to do and that I am ready to do. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me why I would want to go somewhere as crazy as the People's House, and it's a fair question because there are a lot of um, people who don't don't seem to be totally susceptible to reason. My initials are MTG, and there's another one of those in the People's House, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, 
what I have the ability to do is to mute out the noise, to focus on the mission, and to get into the weeds. And in this case, um, in the case of protecting the Affordable Care Act, I think a lot of the work is going to have to be done in the weeds. What needs to be done on the national level about the opioid ap uh, epidemic? So, you know, the, I'm encouraged to see this past week that um, the numbers, overdose deaths are decreasing in, in here in Nashville, my hometown, um, but overdose deaths continue to be on the rise. Um, tackling the opioid epidemic was one of the core pillars of the unity agenda. Um, that I was really proud to work on in the Biden and Harris administration. And, you know, the way that work had been organized um, was to really think about, number one, um, tackling the supply side of the problem and also addressing in a real and enduring way the demand side of the problem. So let me just start on um, the first piece, which, you know, has two parts. One of it goes back to the issue we were talking about before, um, the deadly drugs that are coming across um, our borders and who are, that are getting to New Hampshire through the mails. Um, we, you know, are seizing more deadly drugs than ever before, um, but we've got to scale up that work and passing the comprehensive bipartisan immigration reform and border security bill would go a long way in updating um, the infrastructure at our, at our Southern border and at our official ports of entry to make sure the deadly drugs are not coming across our borders in the first instance. Um, equally important is tackling the cartels and the criminal en enterprises that are fueling this epidemic. Um, so that's not just the Mexican drug cartels, but that's a big piece of business. And we have extraordinary people um, that I, who I, I was really proud to work with at the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, um, who are laser focused on dismantling these cartels and in the last three and a half years, we've seen a lot of successes on this front. We've also seen a, an evolution in tactics. And today in New Hampshire, many overdose deaths can be traced back to chemical companies in Beijing. And in this administration, um, with the help of members of Congress, I should say, and I'm very proud that Senator Hassan was part of a bipartisan congressional delegation that went to Beijing and that told Xi Jinping, the president of China, um, he needed to crack down on the chemical companies that were fueling overdose deaths. Uh, we've seen a material shift. Uh, we got to keep that progress up. We've got to use every available tool um, and Congress can strengthen many of these tools, including the tool of sanctions to make sure um, that we are cracking down on the sources of these deadly drugs. Um, at the same time, you know, critical is to, for Congress is to increase access to life-saving medication and and life-saving sa and altering treatment um, for people who are facing addiction and who are facing um, conditions that require medical solutions. And, you know, one of the things we were focused on uh, was reducing the barriers to access medically assisted treatment. And the MAT Act was a huge um, important piece of business um, in advancing the cause of, of getting people here in New Hampshire and across the country access to life-saving medication. Narcan is now available over the counter. Narcan and other opioid reversal drugs are available over the counter. We still have to make those uh, life-saving medications affordable, um, but we've made a lot of progress on this front, and I am I am optimistic that we can continue to build on that progress. Um, in it next year. Uh, equally important is to make sure that people in the state are able to get access to the mental health care and substance abuse treatment that they need um, to address the root causes, one of the root drivers of this epidemic. And you know, we were very focused on mental health parity um, because it's a, a truly bipartisan idea that Mental health care is health care, period. And that people who are trying to get uh, their, insur their insurance company, big insurance company should be covering mental health care treatment in the same way that they cover any other treatment. Um, and there's a lot of room for improvement on that front. Um, but we were very focused on this in a bipartisan way because this is a deeply bipartisan idea, uh, mental health parity. 
Um, so I want to be a part of building on the successes we've seen and the progress we've seen. Um, but this continues to be the deadliest drug epidemic in our nation's history. You know, more people in this country between the ages of 18 and 45 die from a drug overdose than any other cause. Um, and we, we, we cannot let up. We've got to continue on this fight. Um, so you worked um, for a Republican in the Senate, and you, you've worked at a Democratic White House. Um, you, you touched on bipartisanship a little bit earlier, um, but what do we need to do to get past the winning is the only thing mentality that seems to be pervading Washington right now? You know, I I was um, proud to be a part of a team, a bipartisan team led by Senator John McCain and Senator Chuck Schumer uh, to work on comprehensive bipartisan immigration reform and border security. Um, we don't see enough of these kinds of efforts, um, but they're still there. And and I think we've got to build what I what I observed, you know, what allows for this to happen. I think part of it is an orientation that when you are elected to represent um, the people of your district. You are a representative. Uh, you work for everyone in that district, including the people who didn't vote for you. And this was the, the core idea that animated the Biden-Harris administration's unity agenda that, you know, President Biden promised on day one he would be a president for all Americans, um, including and especially those who, di who didn't vote for him, um, because that is the core promise of our democracy. That is what the constitution requires and what really everything that's great about American democracy arises from, that you you represent everyone. And, and so what does that mean? That means that you know you are clear about your principles and your priorities. And and you know, I've I've observed and many of my heroes have been able to work and advance the cause of the, the causes of democracy, fairness, and freedom. Um, on a bipartisan basis without compromising their principles. And, you know, one great example uh, that I look to, and and again, the unity agenda gives me a lot of hope because what you see are people uh, who really don't agree on much coming together and finding, in some cases, the 30%, but um, in other cases, maybe just 3% or 0.3%. But, you know, when we talk about keeping our kids safe online, um, one of the imperatives is really to 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 advance legislation that's going to create some basic guardrails um, for the big tech companies and big tech platforms that have been really allowed to operate without any guardrails at all. And there's a piece of legislation called the Kids Online Safety Act. Um, you know, in the Senate, it was passed through the Senate recently. We had Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee and Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut who came together to pass this, to, to advance this important piece of legislation. You know, that those are two very different members of Congress who, who probably don't agree on, you know, 80 to 90% of issues, but they found, you know, the, the 10 to 20% and were able to make progress. Um, so that's that's the spirit in which I wanna work and, and in which I will work. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's what will bring us back um, is just going back to the basics that it's, it's the job uh, to get the job done and to actually find ways to work with people who we don't totally agree with. And I, I'd add that, you know, one area that gives me a lot of hope too, um, it goes back to antitrust and consumer protection, that that basic agenda um, where we see um, extraordinary coalitions of people who probably have never worked together before. You know, um, Senator Amy Klobuchar, who wrote an 800-ish page book, a very very large book on antitrust, um, which many people, including people who are not her blood relatives, have purchased and read and been inspired by, um, which which is very exciting from, from my perspective. She's found ways to work with Josh Hawley, uh, with Ted Cruz, with Tom Cotton, with people who, uh, you know, when you look at the Senate Judiciary Committee, she probably doesn't work with very often at all, though I'm sure she tries. Um, but there, there are areas of agreement where we can make good and meaningful progress, and I will always find them and work to get the job done. 
You mentioned um, young people and the internet and social media a little while ago. Is, is there a point at which freedom of speech should be limited? And if so, how would you approach it? You know, I think, um, look, the First Amendment is truly an essential cornerstone of American democracy. And what I observed, um, you know, in some ways beginning, but it predates a bit uh, my time clerking on the Supreme Court, you know, Citizens United, for example, was a complete inversion of our First Amendment, uh, a total inversion of our First Amendment, which is meant to protect freedom of speech and is is essential to protecting the right to vote. Um, but what we saw there was a real inversion of these principles to create a totally unlevel playing field. Um, so look, I think I think that any piece of legislation um, that's going to be impacting uh, the rights of speech has got to be carefully crafted um, because of the essential role that the First Amendment plays. But I believe there are very constitutional ways, completely constitutional ways um, to bring some measure of accountability and even more so safety um, to online platforms that for so long have been um, really not safe places for our kids. Um, you know, so I think that there are a number of ways to advance responsible constitutional solutions um, to a problem that just keeps getting worse every year. You know, the Surgeon General has issued warnings and reports um, that, it, that really show us um, the scope and gravity of this challenge um, for young people. Well, um, so so we're at the end of our hour and and at, and at the end of our questions, I believe. So we certainly appreciate you you taking the time.